In the Trenches with Ryan Roxy. Hello, 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 folks. Uh, my name is Ryan Roxy, and welcome to In the Trenches podcast, a, another episode um, where we sort of bring on guitar players, musicians, singers. Today, we actually have a guitar player, so I'm excited about that. And uh, we sort of dive deep into what makes it, uh, how do you do this in the music business? How do you even begin in 2020 to say, hey, I want to be a rock and roller. I want to do it full time and I don't want to be broke doing it. So that's uh, sort of the stuff we're going to be talking about with our guest. Um, he's in one of the uh, biggest rock and roll bands right now uh, these days. And uh, they've come up over the years. I've, I've had the pleasure of meeting him. I'll, it will maybe uh, reintroduce myself again, but we haven't spent a lot of time together. But I'm hoping that because we're both guitar players and reading by our influences. I think we have a lot of similar influences. We will uh, hit things off as we should. So uh, will you help me welcome into the trenches, Adam Slack from the band The Struts. Hello, Adam. Hello. Hey, what's happening, Hello. man? <laughs> I am, uh, I'm the LA uh, guy I'm usually. Old. Yeah, are you? Good. So. The thing is, right. right off the bat, you're coming from Los Angeles. Yes? You're living in Los Angeles. Yes. Yes. And uh, the band originally yes. formed in the UK. I myself am lived in Los Angeles most of my life, but now I'm in Europe and I'm living in Europe. So we've sort of swapped places uh, the last couple of years. <laughs> and um, wow. you play... You yeah. playing? Uh, there is going to be a little bit of a delay, obviously, with uh, with our communication right now because of the internet situation that we have right now in California, coming all streaming all the way across to Sweden. So I will be very sensitive about the answers coming in with a slight delay. So I just want to, uh, again, for our listeners, introduce you as the guitarist Adam Slack from the band The Struts. Thank you very much for coming on. Well, thank you for having me, mate. That's uh, very kind of you. Very good. Um, I wanted to say, I was turned on to the band from Nikki Six uh, when uh, we played, we were opening up for Motley Crue on most of their uh, final tour, but you guys got the last show at the Staples Center because we were in Hawaii doing a show and I really wanted to do that Staples Center show. So how did that Staples Center show go with the, with the last sort of show of Motley Crue's career? Um, oh man. Yeah. That was a while ago actually, wasn't it? It was um, the end of 2015. Yes, and it that was. was. That capped like um, a, a really good year for us. Cause we, it was our first U S tour that year. Like, you know, the band was almost about to break up in England because nothing was happening and we just got dropped and then uh, found new management and came to America. So we did a whole tour of um, the States and then, yeah, getting to play the Staples Center really just put the cherry on the cake, really. It was <laughs> uh, it was a really good gig. Um, yeah, it was one in Vegas and then I think three Staples shows and the last one was New Year's Eve and Tommy's drum uh, roller coaster thing and I got caught like five minutes before midnight <laughs> upside down so they missed the whole countdown <laughs> uh I, you would be you wouldn't be shocked at how many times that actually happened on the two because we did two years of touring with them uh, playing with alice cooper and stuff so that was quite uh oh, wow. yeah it, it wasn't a nightly occurrence but it did happen quite often but it's it's refreshing to hear and <laughs> that you know that you say the band had pretty much at one point was facing elimination, but you kept at it. You had this percept, you had the um, perseverance and obviously through management. And I actually think a lot of great word of mouth from guys like Nikki six, who turned me on to you uh, bands like the Foo Fighters who eventually took you out on tour and the Rolling Stones, all those kind of helped to sort of, gravitate you towards this higher echelon of, of uh, music that you guys are, are sort of associated with now. So I would, would you say that your success could be a, a bit uh, thanks to some really nice associations? 
Definitely. I think, you know, we were lucky enough to open up for the Stones in 2014 in uh, Paris. And I think the reason why we had a good management at the time, but, the, you know, they were very pop band oriented and, you know, making the music that we make. It ended up getting to this crossroads that radio didn't want to play us in England. The label were like, well, if they don't want to play you, then you, there's only one shot in England. And it's Radio One. If you don't get that, then it's like game over. And then our management were just like, yeah, I think you have to be doing more pop music. And it was thanks to, I had a Facebook profile picture of me on stage at the Stones gig, like with this huge crowd. I'm just putting my hands <laughs> in the air. It was a really cool shot. And, you know, that, that sparked the interest from this new management label because they're like, well, hold on, who's this band that's done this? Right. And then from that, it kind of, uh, it, that, you know, the, you know they, they say it's like, I know luck comes into bands break, uh, like blowing up and stuff, and I think that was a big part, like because then that sparked interest with somebody else and somebody else, and then it right. was just like a chain reaction thing from that one gig. So, well, obviously, yeah, I think, and like you say, Nikki Six saying that, and so lovely. One of the things that I think helps a band out, and that a lot of uh, people that listen to the show are in bands themselves, and they're trying to make their way out, and, and they're probably asking themselves, well, how can I open up for the Rolling Stones? But the first thing that comes to mind is a really solid performance, a live band, because nothing turns people on uh, more to rock and roll when, until they go see it live, and it's a really uh, well thought out, well oiled machine that has a performance and obviously you have a front man in luke that is really special so it's it's a great combination and i and i see that you and luke have been sort of the nucleus for many many years i know that you came from a little bit closer to nottingham growing up and then he was a little bit more south but you guys met at one point and just mm -hmm. you had that guitarist vocalist lead singer relationship now me having those relationships before with other bands they don't always go north sometimes they go real south if you know what i mean <laughs> but there is a a sort of a roller coaster mm. how has your yeah. guys relationship been over the years and where are you at now yeah i mean i met luke when i was 17 and i'm 29 now so it's been a, a long uh, a long journey together um to be honest with you uh just you know you watch like documentaries on bands and you hear the stories of bands and i think we've been very fortunate with our relationship um like creatively and as mates i think we're very good at we're I'm very emotionally aware people um and you know we've spent the best part of like i'd say like 90 percent of the last 10 years either living with each other or living in very close quarters with one another so you know we've been tested in a, a, a sense in that way but you know i think he knows when i'm pissed off and i know when he's pissed off and it's we've never argued once we've had like heated debates but we're not like never fallen out i'd say i think we've just we know when someone's buttons have been pressed and when to leave them alone kind of thing right and creatively, you know, we've just we've been writing in this quarantine time, and well, actually, the four of us is a band, which is the first time we've really ever done that, just the four of us, um, and it's been really, really good. Um, but no, me and him, you know, that's we've had important. Our bits and bobs over the years, but yeah, for the most part, stronger than ever. Yeah, that's great because uh, you know because you do hear those you know, rock, those rock biographies where it, it definitely doesn't seem like it's an easy road. And a lot of times they try to gloss over it, but I like the fact that you're honest about it. You know what pushes each other's buttons, but at the same time, you guys also know that what you have together works and it obviously works as a unit. Um, do you like being the only guitar player in the band or do you ever wish you had your sort of Ron Wood or your Izzy Stradlin to go along with you? Or how is the lineup? Um, it's weird. I, I've, I've been asked that a few times and if I'm like brutally honest, like I've never played in a band with another guitar player, like other than like when I used to 
me and Luke first started, it was just the two of us. So we'd play like covers gigs at the pub with another right. guitar player. And I was like rhythm guitar because I wasn't like a good guitar player when we first met. It was something that I, you know, I was in, you know, my first influence was Green Day. So like my first band, you know, was just like punky four chord poppy kind of thing so when i met luke it was just at this cusp of time when i kind of just started listening to more music so it was like a really good time but i think like when we were playing covers gigs and stuff because i wasn't as confident as a player um i liked it and now i don't know like i it's just something i've never really done i think live like i get annoyed sometimes there's so many cool parts on the record and just just start playing a lead part without having that right. bass underneath like of a yeah. guitar playing you want that extra like, part sometimes yeah sometimes it sucks but but i can't yeah so but you know it's i kind of like being the only guy and then i don't know i don't know what the dynamic would be with someone else then do what would i argue like I want to play this part or like, no, that's my right. part. I wrote that part. You get and to you decide I mean? which, which that. parts you want to play. You yeah. get to decide. Oh, which I might parts. Be... Yeah. And I might be completely jealous. Like what if they're like way better than I am? And I know it shouldn't be a competition, but you know, they're shredding all the time. And then like, I'm like, shit, wait, what is the fuck's this guy? <laughs> well, so I, think I, the... I, I do my best not to be a uh, green with envy. <laughs> I think the the mark of a truly great band is is when they can take different types of influences, whether it is punk rock and like you said, uh, Green Day. I hear some. There's even Ramones in that Hus Husker Du sort of type of music that has an edginess, yeah. as well as classic rock. And maybe that came up through the pubs when you're learning. But you guys have managed to combine those two types, create your own style with still giving a feel to uh, you know, I would say big rock. It's a weird word, term to use because I don't know how to say it, but big rock because you you are d obviously destined to play larger places than clubs, but it still feels right in a club as well. Right. Yeah. I mean, hopefully. <laughs> I mean, that's the <laughs> aim was, and the ethos of the band from the beginning was like we want to be in in the biggest band in the world and play in the biggest venues and. You know that, that is the dream, but yeah, it, it does work in a club as well because like we do have that, like the, the records and our live show are like almost different entities. It's like in the studio we have had like the luxury of kind of like I do put four guitar tracks on. We do have like a fucking synth because I did. We've always wanted to make the music sound current, not just like a regurgitation of the past, because right. we've there is there's already been. The Rolling Stones and Queen and like Slade and Sweet and all these bands have already existed. So like, why try and just recreate it exactly the same? There's just no point. So it's like, I feel like you know we do put these synthesizers on. Then it comes to live, and like some songs do have a bit of tracks on for those synth parts, but for the most part, it's like a a raw and ready to go version of what's on the album, you know, which exactly. is I love because it's just it's more just. It's like garage rock almost, like version of like of what the album was. <laughs> well, you definitely are using for me the dream type of equipment because I'm I I saw a lot of pictures when I was doing the research for this interview. I'm a Gibson guy myself. I love to play Les Pauls and a bunch of different Gibson designs. Got and you might have one right there. <laughs> but I also saw a recent picture as well as be, as of a Strat that you got with the same figuration that I got with my sort of dream Strat, a, a double coil in the back and two singles. And I was wondering, um, are you playing both those types of guitars live for the, you pick the right guitar for the right song and tell us about that new Strat and obviously your classic Gibsons. Um, yeah, I think for the most part, like, I think moving into this new cycle of music that we've got coming, um, I can't say too much about it because I'll get slapped on the wrist, but there's definitely new stuff coming, obviously. Um, but there's def I'm literally going to go pick up a guitar, another guitar today made by Bruce Nelson, who made my Strat. I've got a Telly Star one with 
a humbucker in the bridge and then like a mini humbucker in the neck. Nice. Um, so it's like completely hummus, but it's going to be really, really cool. Um, but I think now more than ever with the new music that's coming and the old music, I've kind of just been getting by by using my, my main Les Paul. Um, the reason I've got a Les Paul is because when we were playing the smaller clubs, I did have a junior, which was like my favorite. I had like a 58 junior. But some of the smaller clubs, the lights and shit, the, the, the P90. You'll get that like, sound. Yeah, you'll get that, <laughs> that, that hum. No, I played a whole show. <laughs> Backwards. <laughs> yeah, so I'm playing in Fort Lauderdale like this. Oh, you know, man. a microphone here because right. I do that. It's like, mm. <laughs> so I was like, I need a humbucker style guitar. Right. And then my front of house guy just loves this Les Paul so much. He's like, just just play that. But I think yep. definitely now I've really, I've got I've just set my new pedal board up. Some guys in Nashville, got, I got one of those RGM um, nice. mastermind things. So now I can actually start for each song putting effects in for each part of the song and I there's a lot of songs that well not a lot there's like two or three songs that are in open G on the record that I don't exactly. play in open G live and I think now I have the strap which just sounds awesome I've been using that on some new music um because I used to play strats all the time so I've come back to that but the humbug could just make it still makes it sound closer to the Les Paul when I need it to right um but then you just can't beat the neck and like that middle neck position that you just don't get on any other guitar, right. which is great for some songs. So I think definitely song specific guitars will be coming in on the new tour for sure. That's great. That's great. I, I, I actually am curious about that because the guitars present to the audience the type of song. Sometimes you play the right guitar for the right song and the way it looks aesthetically. But have you found that right amp setup that can make all those different types of guitars work together so i have like um i have it's like a three amp system which is all um so they're all playing in unison so it's like a blend of three amps awesome. which sounds amazing now i had to move to winnie's because well i wasn't a big fan at first and i'm still not but i've got like a microphone on my pedal board because what i miss is that sound between the amp and your ear that space in between i call i like, call it moving air if you can yeah. if you can feel the moving of the air then you know it's, it's something that you can't explain when you have in ears on it just takes you just have to get used to it but i've got this microphone on my pedal board which faces back towards my amps now okay and it's like it just captures that feeling of just not hearing it direct like you're in a studio and it's just sounds so much better now but i have an ac30 um, vox ac30 right yeah and then i have like this supro like one speaker i can't remember what it's called it's like it's a little combo Tiny little guy. one knob yeah one knob and you probably have it up to 11 yeah 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 pretty much <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and then i have a solo dallas um like uh, I don't know if you know them. There's a guy in Sabah? California, Solo Dallas. He, he oh, makes Solo Dallas. Yeah, I have heard of that amp company. I, I haven't tried them yet, but I've I have heard of them. Yeah. Yeah, so it's modeled after Angus Young's like Black Flag, like uh, Marshall, like uh, fucking I don't know what you call them, but right. it's um, the blend of the three. It's All this. Together. Yeah, you you don't need another guitar player when you have three great amps playing the exact chord that you want all in unison, right? Yeah, and it's like J3, who's our front of house, um, is an amazing guitar player himself. He was actually in Tommy Lee's Methods Mayhem band. All right. um, so he's like like the biggest nerd when it comes. So he's me and him over the years have like perfected this amp setup. So when like he's mixing us out front, he's got four microphones on the amp split stereo like nice it's like guitar and <laughs> vocals and then like a bit of drums and bass so, <laughs> so the so the amp setup has basically evolved along with the band's career from yeah. from clubs theaters all the way up to stadiums and then you can vacillate in between and it works for for everything at this point right yeah and like i've got attenuators on everything now so it's like it's all can just if we're playing a huge arena or, you know, a 200 capacity club, it can just move yeah. accordingly. 
Right. So, I, I mean, the show that we have in the trenches podcast is basically half gearheads that love this talk and half, yeah. you know, half true fans that might not play music yet want are interested in it but but they want to hear the stories of how they can try and get into the band so i try to split the two but it mm -hmm. always seems when i get into when i get into the gear i kind of like to fall into it too because i'm always curious about you know what works for some people you know what what is their favorite go-to amp for me it's always been a, a marshall jcm 800 but over right. the last few years, I've been obviously in the studio. You experiment with modeling amps, you know, which all kind yeah. of, I want them to model my JCM 800. But I always want that perfect sort of, if, if I could have one rig that could do it all, it would be great. But it's not always the case. Yeah. You know? Like for me, my. Are you cut out for a second? Okay. What happened there? Nope. Something just got a little bit weird. Hopefully you can hear me. I can I can't hear you right now. No, your 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 microphone went away. That's so bizarre. Do you want to go back or yeah, now you're back. Now you're back. I'm back. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah. I think my headphones are Bluetooth to my phone. So it like connected to that. <gasps> Oof. Sorry. Yeah. Yes, I'm yes, not texting. I'm here. I'm here. I'm back. I'm back. <laughs> Um, well, the good news no. is this is not live, so we're gonna yeah. we're gonna edit it all the good all the good parts and on and all the crap we'll we'll just save for the bonus reel. <laughs> okay. Um, so yeah, what I was saying was like for me, my my go to amp was always an AC30 or um, well, I mean I had an AC15 when I was playing when I was younger. I had like you know the what do you call them like not a valve amp beforehand, and then I like a, a Vox like. Solid state, were you saying? Thank you. That's the one. There you go. State. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, well, the, the, the cheaper ones that, that that sometimes you get that diamond in the rough where the solid state amp just sounds incredible. But, you know. Yeah. But I maybe not. It. <laughs> but I had a hand-wired AC-15, and then it was like I, I, I flirted with other things for ages. But, like, for me, it's just what my ear was always gravitating to. But, like, now I – so that's why it's still in like my mixture of amps because – when I have it in my in-ears now, I have like the Plexi amp and like the Supro. It sounds really nice, but then I'm like, it's just missing that <laughs> sound on top of it. <laughs> yeah, and that's, so, that's the punk rock just... part that you need. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. So then you add that in, like suddenly it's like, ah, there we go. It's well, so, I, so, I, so. I saw that you're you, the, the 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 Les Paul Jr. that you had this love yeah. for in the beginning of of the struts and the beginning of your uh, career, and then you eventually have moved over to Les Paul's because of the humbucker sound. You get rid of that hum. But I saw that you had a rock and roll relics plus yeah. uh, LP Jr. I, I love Billy because he's been actually, Billy Rose been on the show. We talk oh, about cool. his guitars a lot. So um, is that a nice playing guitar that you have in your arsenal as well? Yeah. Yeah. It's actually one that I keep meaning to get out. It's in Nashville in my storage unit is where all, most of my stuff is. Um, but yeah, I love that guitar. And uh, it's funny, Pat Smear from the Foo Fighters was like, he was like, I want to buy one. I want to buy one. And I was like, we'll have to ask Billy to make you one. Because yeah. I saw, um, I found out through, about them through Billy Joe from Green Day. Because um, right. I saw he had like a US flag one. And I was like, oh, it'd be cool if I had like a black and white Union Jack one. And right. I just managed to get in touch. And he's like, do you think you can make it? So he made it. And he made a couple of them. Um, but yeah, it's a great guitar. It's like just a single humbucker again because of the p90 thing i love p90s okay. as well but uh, that i just put a humbucker in it i actually have a lot uh, uh that tv was it tv yellow last pan uh lp <laughs> jr but i have the i have the billy joe armstrong model and that oh, actually cool. that that p90 that's in the back pickup right there it, it, it cranks it really does it sounds great so it's oh, a special okay. type it's a special type of p90 that they use for it and for those of you that if we're going too far down the rabbit hole of gear talk well hold on we're going to come back with some stories because but I, I'll, I'll slowly bring us back out of there but i just i just love it when when i can just talk you know gear to someone you know that is as influenced by the same bands but we come from different generations and you know and sometimes when i see the younger generations that have uh been influenced by the same bands i was whether it's slade sweet you already named a few that are, are classic cheap trick for me was sort of my beatles yeah. but uh wow. as far, but i i kind of always blame it on 
either really good parenting or really bad parenting. <laughs> and <laughs> some, and sometimes, you know, your parents have great album collections, but you don't realize it until a little bit later. So yeah, completely. Is that what happened to you? Like, did you, like, did you have, did your parents, cause you're, you're a bit younger than me. So your parents probably, instead of the old Beatles albums, they may have had Oasis albums. Is that true or something like that? Well, so my dad's, my dad's like grew up in the 60s. My dad's 73 years old. So he was always like, on the way to school, it would be like um, the Beatles, but he was like mainly John Lennon. So like it'd be John Lennon right. solo stuff or Beatles. And then like Hermits, Hermits and all these like 60s bands and stuff like that. And uh, and he was, and, and like as a teenager, like I was like, nah, this is shit. I'm not <laughs> listening to this. And my mum my would like grow up on like, in the kitchen with like Oasis playing and I didn't like that. And then I remember, I, it's funny you say this because literally the other day I was listening to Pink Floyd and um, it, she, I remember her telling me about, she, she came into my room like, you should listen to this band called like Pink Floyd. And, and I was like, the name sounds like lame. And then they were like, Dark Side of the Moon. And I just didn't get it. And she'd come in and say, like, listen to this band, Mott the Hoople. And I remember her getting me to show me um, Roll Away the Stone live on Top of the Pops. And I just didn't get any of it. Like at the time, and I was, I was like, Green Day's the only shit I listen to. <laughs> and then like, I hit like 16. And then I, I went and bought um, Definitely Maybe by Oasis from like a, First like record, a CD. Yeah. Damn. yeah. And What's the Story, Morning Glory. And I kind of just sat and listened to them and it was like, oh my God, this is like incredible. This is like the sound I've been wanting to hear in my head this whole time. And and then, I, you know, as you do, I mean, I, I was looking at it. We had YouTube when I was like 16. So like, you just start diving into these rabbit holes on YouTube of like interviews with the band because you just like become obsessed with them. Yeah, yeah. And I was obsessed with the Oasis, and then I just hear them talking about the Beatles, Slade, David Bowie, Sweet, Mott the Hoople, and all these like glam bands and T Rex and stuff like that. So then I was like, Mum, you know those bands that you talked to me about? Like, what were they again? <laughs> and then yeah. it was like, Wow, you had back. a whole new I, education. Yeah. Yeah, and then I met Luke, like, literally then. So then it was like, I just got into the Beatles and Slade. And then I always say, like, if I met Luke, like, six months prior to that, I would have been like, nah, I'm not into it. Not the right guy, yeah. He's, he, yeah, yeah so, I, I, Green Day, Green Day. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Game of the good time. <laughs> yeah, so it was like that perfect timing of, and then he became, like, my older brother. And he was like, oh, listen to the Stones. And then my dad was, like, always a no Stones fan. It was, like, Beatles only. Right, um, right. So I was kind of like the same. And then like, it wasn't until we did the pub gigs and we played jumping Jack flash. And I was like, huh, I get it now. Like, and then that Isn't that funny? Another- like there, there was this Beatles and stones rivalry back in the UK back in the day. And then it, it, it repeated itself in a way with Oasis versus blur in that yeah. sense. Do you feel that perhaps uh, th- does do stress? Do you have either a, f- friendly comp competitive band from the uk or even the world that it could be your blur or your oasis to right. your struts do you have any of those types of bands you think because I, I i think rock and roll rivalry helps everybody it's a good yeah, story i mean like i think there's been like i mean people like to put like a rivalry on it i think I, i've just seen things on the internet like obviously like Greta van fleet like we Right. We took them on their first tour, and then like subsequently they've blown up, and like, oh, yeah. and they're really big. But like, you know, I think people like put us in the same wheelhouse because it's like a four-piece band, lead singer, classic influences. So a lot of people have been putting like, us right. together. I can see the similarity, um, but at the end, it's such two different types of bands and two different things. And I think there's so much room to flourish for both of your bands. Obviously, I think totally. it's great. Um, yeah. But, but it, but hey, man, why not? As uh, don't let as as Alice Cooper would always tell me, don't let the truth get in the way of a big uh, of a, uh, don't let the truth get in the way of a good yeah. story. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So hey, um, I w- I wanted to basically move on with what you guys are doing currently because I've seen your Sunday live streams that you're doing mm-hmm. Sunday service, yeah. and uh, it, does that happen? Is that going to happen not just in quarantine, or is that going to be happening? throughout you know until you guys get back on the road or where is this where is this new stage that we're going to find to perform on now um to be honest with you, I th- well in short like this weekend's the last sunday service 
of this season we're saying um gotcha um so it, it's been eight episodes it was just something for the fans and then, you know originally the lockdown was meant to be for two weeks so we were like oh well, well just to keep people happy or whatever in the meantime but we are working on other stuff um like i say I, i'm not allowed to say at the moment because i'll just get right. told off by my management no um, problem but there is there is big stuff coming from us but to be honest with you yeah gig wise i mean god knows when we'll be able to do a gig again um right. i guess it's just maybe like live streams still stuff like that um that we'll have to do in the meantime but i just hope you know I, I, i'm hoping like by january or i mean hopefully yeah. december end of the year there's a possibility of doing shows again but i just don't know somebody sent me a, a, a billboard for for the band i play in with alice cooper and it was a nice billboard because and it was a rescheduled date on a billboard so they've gone all the trouble to make a re you know to put up a billboard okay. with it with a new date and this isn't all the way until the end of october i guess it's going to happen but at this at the same time you do have to be a little bit uh you have to be a little question it a little bit and not be, you know, like I'll be happily surprised if everything goes back to the way it was in a way, but I don't ever think I want to be prepared for what's going to ha be the new normal and what could be the new normal, you know, mm -hmm. as far as live performance. But it, being that we can't talk about the, the uh, future stuff right now, because I know it's all under wraps and you guys are working on it hard. I want to talk a little bit about uh, this, the song that you did uh, with Kesha as well uh -huh. as with my boss with Alice Cooper, because that all came off of, of the second album. And uh, how yeah. were those experiences working? You know, because that's, this was off of the, the young and dangerous album. And uh, it was, it was uh, the Kesha song was uh, body works. And the Alice Cooper song was, what was that? The name of that one? Well, I think with the Alice thing, it was like more just like a cameo in the music video. Like we didn't, okay. We didn't like write with him or anything like that. But it was, we were in Vegas and you guys were in Vegas. You were doing a show. You were doing a show. Um, yeah. And uh, we were, well, we we basically flew in from in, from London to Vegas. At, we got in at midnight and then we started shooting a music video at like 2 a.m., which was ridiculous in uh, season yeah. Alice. Yeah. And then Alice was there. So we were like, and we knew he was like a fan of the band. So we just said, hey, do you want to be on any music video? And then it was just we went into the dressing room and he was throwing knives at, uh, at a picture of Johnny Depp. <laughs> um, yeah, as he does, <laughs> not yeah. nightly, or somebody in the band, or Johnny Depp, or somebody yeah. in the Hollywood Vampires. <laughs> well, just so you know, just so you know, Nikki told me, I told Alice. So it kind of—I'm ah. sort of the middle. I'm, I'm sort of the middleman in this one. So about well, it. Thank it, you very it, much. Yeah. Well, it was, it was it went back to that song uh put your money on me i think that was like such a great song great video oh, and cool. and that sort of it it had that sort of feeling of like it, it, it's rock and roll and and you can oh, awesome. something that's tangible about rock and roll is it's like it doesn't you can't you couldn't put it in a box you get because it's because you look as you look rock as fuck but at the same time the song the song has really great pop sensibility and then the mm. video is, is was cool so yeah i i think maybe i had a little hand in and and turning you guys on to alice but i had nothing to do with kesha and that thing yeah. turned into <clears throat> that turned into way more than just a cameo video appearance that turned into two separate singles and how did that yeah. come about yeah well it was like we wanted someone to feature on a song on the new album and then when we wrote body talks it was like um this seems like the kind of song to have a female on it. And we'd met Kesha uh, like two years prior. Um, and we did a show together in like, Ohio and we became friends. And then we found out uh, we were like on the same management as well. So it was just a case of like asking and she heard like the riff, the opening, and she's like, yeah, I'm in. And I was like, oh, okay, <laughs> great, <laughs> sweet. Um, so you had, yeah, you had me at the dun da dun. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so she ended up there we you know she sang on it and then we had two versions anyway like because body talks had, i think had already come out by the time she said yes so we ended up releasing two versions one with her on which was a bit more like acoustic driven um and that just turned into yeah like we ended up doing jimmy fallon which was awesome because she was on it and uh yeah it was it was cool and she's awesome like she's now like a good friend and uh, she's 
got a great voice and she's got great presence as well. We did end up doing a gig together in uh, what's it called? Atlantic City, which is really cool. So has the has the entire band relocated to Los Angeles at this point? And are you guys is that <laughs> Sort of because I, I, when I when I look at the, just the geography of it and a lot because a lot of people assume that you come from the UK. Oh, they're London based, but it, it wasn't yeah. London based. You guys no. bashed it out in the clubs. You were in the trenches all over the place. So, you know, you definitely weren't like in in the city of London when no. you were when you were, you know, really cutting your teeth at this. Now that the bands moved to Los Angeles, do you find there is a scene. Is there a camaraderie the way it was for me when I lived in Los Angeles? Or w what's it like? Obviously, now is a completely different story. But coming yeah. in as a, a bit more of the, uh, you know, you have a name. You have the hype. You have sort of a reputation as the struts. And what what's it like living in Los Angeles for all you guys? Um, yeah, like we, we live together in Derby in England. And then we all moved out. We all live separately miles away from each other. So... When we finished, we spent so much time in the States and we couldn't really afford to move to L.A. for the last few years because although we were touring so much, touring cost a lot of money. It and, does. You know, so we just didn't have the money to move here and make it a viable option when because we tour so much like spending a couple of grand on rent a month when you're never there. It just seems stupid. Right. So um, but now it's like we've got to a point where. um. And it's good because we all live really close to each other. Um, so it would just made sense, like money, and we had the money to be able to do it now. And thank God we did because now this virus has kicked off. We can actually, you know, if we weren't in the same city, we would have been screwed. So um, we're obviously being safe, and we got together not long ago, but we all got tested before we got together and stuff like that. So we're not being, um, I don't know irresponsible in any yeah, way if but, you guys are separated and and we know that you know you're in this recording studio you are going to have separation i mean luke's going to be in his own vocal booth you're going to be in your guitar world you you know mm -hmm. you guys have the budgets to to, to make all this happen now <clears throat> you, you know it, it's it is a very creative time right now i mean because i people look at about doom and gloom and i try not to go down that hole of it being because it is could be negative, but it could also be viewed as a positive because this could be one of the most creative times for bands because you yeah, have that honestly, time. Yeah, it honestly has been like because if we're if I'm honest, like the last album, you know, we've been a band for a long time and only done two albums, and it's because we got fucked around in England and took years for our first album to come out. And then we toured that album so much, like because it got re-released in 2016 as well with new songs, we like we spent, you know, 90% of the year of the last five years on the road. And when we did Young and Dangerous, it was like literally writing. It's, we would fly back to England from Canada or somewhere right. to write for like five days and then go back on tour again. And it was just, it was exhausting to be honest. And like, we oh, I mean, by the end of it, we were like, I we can just, got fucking... <laughs> I can imagine how hard it is for you guys to have this album that you've had. And it's a great album, but at the same time, these are people that are are seemingly hearing it for the first time, and you guys have had it under your belts for a long time. So you know the songs, and you you know, uh, you know, you've definitely been through them through many many tours. But then it's it must be a trip to just play it for people who this is their first time hearing. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. And like These years later. <laughs> yeah. I mean, like, could have been me, kiss this and put your money on me. Well, could have been me and kiss this in particular. They were written in 2011. And then they came out in 2014. Then they came out again in like 2015. And then it was just like, wow. And then like, could have been me just got licensed for a big advert like two weeks ago. And it's like still living off that song, you know? <laughs> um, hey. But like, yeah, I mean, it's great. Young and Dangerous was great. But like the, the whole process of it was exhausting and like this kind of virus kicked off and like we obviously can't tour now. And this is the first time we've been in one place for more than like two weeks in five years. So uh, when we got together to write, you know, a couple of weeks ago, um, it was like the most effortless, effortless thing we've ever do like come to creative because it was like we had a moment to just decompress and finally like some inspiration can come back because you know we, we were going into things like what should we write about 
we can't just keep writing about being in a band and being on the road because literally five percent of no one percent of the world's population can actually relate to that right <laughs> less yeah. than that if, yeah. yeah and it's not about <laughs> but like you want to write about stuff that people can listen and relate to because that's what i like you know when i listen to a band and like fuck they felt the way i felt that's what i love and it's like we had nothing to write about and now we do which is lovely <laughs> Well, that's great. I, I, I do also think that the whenever you get into a guitar bass band, those of you listening out there, because uh, a lot of guitar players are, are out there listening, guitar bass bands have that luxury of having a, writing timeless songs. And you are proof of that because you said that that song was written in a certain year, but it's you're still getting a fresh new look on it and fresh new chances off it all the time. Um, I think the story is one of uh, perseverance. You guys definitely bashed it out in the uk from what you're telling me it was you oh. did a lot of the rock and roll cliche things that happened but hey literally yeah <laughs> you had it's management so since you were 14 years old though you did something yeah. i don't know how you found management since you were so young because <laughs> i still haven't found management <laughs> <laughs> well to be honest with you it's like i was the writer in my school but i started playing guitar when i was like 13 started writing songs when i was like 13 and had my first band, which was like really influenced by Green Day. And I, I was the writer in that band for the majority of it anyway. And there was like a pop band, like they were like called McFly. And they were like, I remember. Kind of, yeah, for sure. Yeah. They were like a boy band, but with guitars. And it was like, they were doing like Beatles, these star music. I, I really like the music. Like right. I wasn't into the whole boy bandy thing of it. I was just like, oh, these songs are nice. Like good quintessential, just acoustic -y, lovely seven chords like old 60s styles melodies and stuff and quite I just, big in the uk that band as well because yeah, i'm not sure they were as big in the us but i know that in the uk they made a huge mark yeah they were they were huge they, it was like um yeah i don't know what you describe it as but they were like a big band like they had number ones and record like really big records and they sold out arenas and they had like a single come out when i was like 14 and I had my first like EP called Hippoponkamus. And it had like a picture of a hippo with a mohawk on it. And like <laughs> the songs were just all four chords. And, you know, I wasn't the singer or anything. And um, I just, I went, I found they were doing a single signing. And I took my, I said to my band, like, let's go and just give them our CD. So I just went along, queued up at like four o'clock in the morning to meet the band, gave them the CD. And they ended up, on myspace <laughs> messaging me like love your cd i passed it on to my manager and then the manager got in touch and he just kind of i didn't sign a deal or anything like that but he would just be like i think you're a really good writer for your age and just, when you write something just send it to me so i had this kind of back and forth with him of i had sitting in my room writing songs and just recording it on like a, a pc microphone on like a program called audacity i think it was called Right. And I'd just write these songs and I'd send them to him. He'd just be like, well, you know, why don't you try this? And it was kind of like, he wasn't a songwriter or anything, but it was like a neutral ear. And he obviously managed like a big band. Um, and he was... That got you, that, that, that sort of opened the door. But... Yeah. And then like when I got, when I was 17, my band wanted to go to university and I didn't want to do that. I was like, I want to carry on with music in some shape or form. And um, he, they, I said like, you know, do you, I, I started singing in my band and I realized very soon like, I had an okay voice, but it wasn't like a great voice. And I was like, you need um, that guy. You need that guy. Yeah, girl. I need that guy. And I didn't, I honestly didn't enjoy being a front man. I was like, I thought I would because in my mind, I was like, I'll just be Billy Joe. Like, that was, <laughs> this is my moment. And then I, I and like, I, I do it. I, I do it like a Green Day tribute thing with my old band when I go home for Christmas for a laugh. We just do it. And it's gone nice. really well. And I, and I enjoyed doing that. But when it was like my own shit, I was like, nah, this isn't for me. Um, so I, I was like, I said to him, like, do you know any singers? And that's when he said, I've just found this singer who's not in a band anymore on MySpace. And it was Luke. In walks and Luke, in, in Luke, 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 Spiller. Walks Luke Spiller. And then the rest, and, and then you guys hit it off. And, and then, but, but still, it doesn't happen overnight. You wrote songs for years, played in clubs for yeah. years. And then obviously... He, you know, I mean, that was I met him in 2009 and we came to and I'd say things only really started happening when we signed with Interscope and toured America in 2015. Like we were playing club shows in England and like we, you know, just the, the 
the normal stuff of we play a festival in France to 5,000 people. We come back, play Leicester to my cousin and the sound man. <laughs> and the sound man walked out halfway through the set. And then oh, we drive man. to like four hours in a fucking van to Canterbury to play to no one. You know, like four people would be there and like, you know, See, it's just, it when you like tell those way. stories, though, to me, there's nothing more inspiring it because you're sitting on the other end of that now in a, in a in a pretty damn good position to to make an important album and to get that hype. When as soon as you know, again, when all this stuff does clear, you guys are going to have a lot of creativity and a lot of and, and a really good jump on everybody else because you've been through all of that. You know, you've, yeah, you've been it's character right. building. I feel like every band should kind of go through that feeling of, you know, lugging your AC 30 up two flights of stairs to set up at like three o'clock in the afternoon to sound check, to wait till nine o'clock to play to two people and then <laughs> lug it all back in the van and drive four hours back home. I think well, you, you were, you were smart. You were smarter with the AC 30s because I, I gave myself, yeah, you two, had the cab I, I, the, I, gave, yeah. I gave myself two hernias uh, trying to lift four twelve cabinets over the years. So yeah, trust <laughs> yeah, me, I know that true. stuff. <laughs> Yeah. But uh, a side note, real quick side note. I'm not sure if you know, but Billy Joe Armstrong is a a, a quite sh a accomplished shredder guitar player. I did not know yeah. that, but but Mike, his bass player, told me one time. He said, "Man, that guy shreds. He just doesn't do it on Green Day albums." So, have you ever gotten to jam with him? Have you met you know Have you met some of your idols yet? Yeah, it's very like probably pretty much met everyone that I've kind of wanted to meet. I haven't met Noel Gallagher, and I think he'd be the last one, I'd say. But I'm also scared shitless of meeting him. Um, so, but I, yeah, I met Billy Joe. <laughs> I met him one. I met him twice. I met him once when I was shit faced, which was really not how I wanted to meet my like childhood idol. Right. But I went to see them at the Palladium in Hollywood, and yeah. I'm friends with his son, and then uh, Joey. And I was like, I'm not going to meet them tonight, so I'll just have a few drinks and enjoy the show because. I was really buzzing because they ended up using a melody of one of our songs in their like their single at the time, 2016. So that we, I got a writing credit on a Green Day song, which I was just like, hello, <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah, and I was so grateful. I, I I ended up basically I watched the gig. It was three hours long. I was having beers. They played that song. I was like, my life's complete. I'm, you know, the drinks were going back, and then I ended up being at this after party with them. And like Billy Joe's like stood here talking to like his wife. And I'm just like, oh, fuck it. I'm just going to have to say something. Is that the oh, picture? Wait, hold on. Was that the moment? No. Oh, <laughs> no, that, was, that, was, that was a different moment. Okay. But, the, but dude, our producer's pretty damn good for getting that. Vic, forget, Vic yeah. you know, you, everything's forgiven for what you did before for putting in that other clip. All right. That was good. All right. Thank you. Yeah, for that, that was awesome. <laughs> um, but I ended up just saying to him, like, Billy, like, oh, like, I just want to say, like, you don't have to do, you don't have to give me that Ryan credit and stuff like that. Anyway, I just, you're my idol. Blah. You blurted like, it all out. Oh, <laughs> so the whole nine yards, yeah. <laughs> and he just goes, Adam, stop. And I was like, what? And he goes, hug me. And I was like, okay. <laughs> yeah, and then, get him. <laughs> and then I, I woke up fully clothed, face, like, head at the other end of the bed, shoes still on. And I was like, oh, my God, what happened last night? And I was like, oh, fuck. The guys that's, were like, that's, the that's rest called of the Billy Joe blackout. Yeah. yeah, Billy Joe Blackout. I heard that happen. Were, he, <laughs> my thing... band were like, Go ahead. Huh? No, my band were like, Oh, Adam, it was lovely. Don't worry about it. And then last year, we opened up for them in Seville, in Spain, for the uh, MTV European Music Awards. Nice. And that photo was from That's then so... because, yeah, that, that, that all the guys in the band, like Mike and Trey and Billy, their wives were all there. And they, as Green Day walked to play the gig, we just opened up. They were like, I, I I don't know if you remember, but we met. And I was like, oh, fuck, I remember. And the, <laughs> the wives were like, come watch the gig with us. And I was like, okay. And then the next night was the awards. And then we're in like the green room area. And they're all there. And I'm like, I can't go over again. Like, I've, I just can't. And then Billy's wife, Adrian, is just like, hey, uh, Billy wants to come and say hello. I was like, oh, fuck. <laughs> And he just basically was like the nicest guy and just said like, Hey man, like I love your band. You guys were awesome last night and nice to see you again. And you know, like, yeah, like just the sweetest guy. And I was just like, Oh, I didn't make an idiot of myself. No, that's amazing. I mean, when you, when you I, meet those guys and they don't, that you, you know, 
listened to as a huge influence growing up and they don't disappoint you. I mean, the, the thing that I can only compare that to is when I put my last solo album out, I, I did a cover of California Man, which is written by The Move, but performed, my version was Cheap Trick and I was off Heaven Tonight. Right. And and Robin Zander comes and does a guest vocal for me on that whole track. So oh, I was, you know, it was it was that same sort of thing. Like, wow, you're really going to do this on, on something that I played on? Oh, God. Okay. Don't fanboy oh, out yeah. too much. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's just, it's an amazing, yeah, that's awesome. And like, I met like Liam Gallagher, who's obviously another like hero of mine. And like, obviously, naturally, I was scared that it was going to be horrible and like we did the it could go down. either way right i mean it could either, yeah. it could go either way and and just so you know if there is some sort of new age greta van fleet struts sort of controversy i'm citing you guys the struts with oasis all right because they're my favorite of, of the two as well although blur yeah. is great blur was great cool. and greta van fleet has their thing no doubt but i'm i'm just you know just so you know i'm citing <laughs> you guys. Oh, well, oh well thank you <laughs> so I mean, how was liam I mean, uh, Liam was like he. We walk in because our dressing room is like opposite, like in these like trailers. And me and Luke are a bit pissed, and we were just like, "Fuck it, well, should we just go over?" Like we're, we're in a better time. Time. So we walk over and we're like, uh, "Can we?" And he's got security guard there. And we're like, "We just played earlier. Can we say hello to Liam?" He's like, "Yeah, go on then." And Liam walks over and he goes, "You're in that fucking band, aren't you? The Strut. What's that? What's your fucking band called? You're on that music video on the boat. You know what I mean?" And we're like. <laughs> and we were like, uh, the struts. He goes, That's your fucking band, isn't it? Yeah. And we would just start, we would just chat to him for like 10 minutes. And he's like the loveliest, heartwarming guy. It was awesome. So they say never meet your heroes, but I disagree. They're all, you're, you're all two and the Stones two. were lovely when we yeah. met them. Like, honestly, eight for eight. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Fuck, well, it was awesome. Well, hey, Noel Gallagher. And, uh, just to reiterate, Greg I mean, Humphrey, like, we love those guys. <laughs> you should. I mean, like I said, it's gonna it's gonna help I, you I was guys. Just gonna say, out. Like, yeah, like yeah, like this this people want to put a rivalry on it, but like we tour together, we're mates, and it's it is what it is. But yeah. you know, if people want to put a label on it, right? And you know, it boosts both our careers. You know, like it did with Oasis and Blair. We want to battle it out for number one. We'll just see about that. I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's an old saying that my friend says all the time. And I don't know if it's how old is he might have come up with it. One hand washes the other. Both hands wash the feet. And uh, you know, you guys are <laughs> you guys are both helping. You know, the cause of rock and roll. As long as guitar driven music stays in the forefront, I'm supporting both you guys' bands. All right. How about that? Exactly. That's what's so awesome about it. It's like, it's too bad. It's like, it's so refreshing to hear this, like, and it's more bands as well. But like, I guess, like, people say, put us in the same thingy, but like, just two bands influenced by old school rock and roll that are like, not, that are actually, you know, getting somewhere. And it's like bringing rock and roll back to the forefront and guitar bands kind of thing, like, of my generation anyway. Absolutely. Well, hey, man, um, our our internet is is sort of acting up on us. I'm going to sort of wrap it up right now before the internet shuts down and before we break the web. Um, but before we go, I just want to give people uh, one more chance because they can't see you out on the road in this sort of moment, but they can get in touch with you on Instagram and uh, the band. Can you tell, for those of that are listening uh, on the podcast, on other platforms, can you tell us what your Instagram and for the you and the band right now and how to get in touch with you, Adam? Yeah, so um, on Instagram, I'm Addo Struts, which is A-D-D-O Struts, or one word, S-T-R-U-T-S. And that's the same for Twitter. Um, yeah, I don't know why it's not, Addo is like an old, nickname i had anyway uh, and, uh the struts is just uh for instagram and youtube and everything else is just at the struts or one word so yeah get in touch but yeah i, I try and like reply to as many people as possible on on twitter and instagram and shit like that so yeah well i really appreciate you taking the time out and uh i go back to being creative with the rest of the guys in the band and the struts and uh, i can't wait for the third record that's going to come out as well as the rest of the listeners um i'm glad we were able to touch on the equipment because that's sort of where i really like to you know get into and grab onto and latch onto i'm i'm curious to hear your 
three uh, amp setup. It, may, it might yeah. have even evolved by the next time we hopefully run across each other. I'm not sure if you remember, but I, I, I met you in catering really early on a few years ago. We were doing Rocklahoma, and you guys had just Oklahoma. played. Yeah, it, it was some sort of rock in Oklahoma, obviously, but they call it the Rocklahoma Fest. And you, and as most bands do, when when in festival settings, they sort of, you know, brush by each other in catering, and they go, "Oh yeah, hey, I, there's a salad, and there's Liam Gallagher." So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but I, no, I, I don't remember Rocklahoma. I remember, like, remember Rock on the Range and stuff like that, or like. Um, the one in North Carolina, what was it? Uh, I don't remember one in Oklahoma, though. Rock Oklahoma. You're probably right. It might have been Rock the Range then. You know what? Or, You're probably or right. The, or because I felt like we met in our, oh, what's it called? It's in North Carolina. Okay. Um, You're exactly right. I'm wrong. It was Rock the Range, I think. Because a Ricky Rackman came out that night. And, yeah. Uh, yeah. And, and 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 you know I I remember you guys and baby metal so it's it's much better oh, yeah. that Gre Gre Van Greta Van Fleet plays a role of, of Blur than baby metal but <laughs> <laughs> so hey Adam I really appreciate you coming on and um, so hang on for just a second while I close things out uh, you have one more time for those of you that are watching on YouTube or uh, Facebook please uh, subscribe to the channel right now if you are listening to it on a other uh, podcast platform just follow adam uh, put those uh follow buttons on one more time vic for us thank you very much and of thank course you. you can always follow our show at ryan roxy on instagram and of course ryan roxy official on the youtube channel so that's about it that's going to wrap us up for another edition of in the trenches with ryan roxy uh, thank you very much adam yes Th thank you very much for having me it's been lovely and it's, it's nice to talk about guitars and bands again. It feels like a while since I've done that. So thank you very much. Really appreciate it. Hopefully we can do it again. And for yeah. you listening out there, until next time, I'm Ryan Roxy. Enjoy the ride. In the Trenches with Ryan Roxy.